Welcome to episode 32 of Military Veterans Podcast, where we talk to veterans to learn about their stories and experiences. And today we're joined by William Taylor, also known as Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, good. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty darn good. Excellent, excellent. And uh, we are doing a remote recording. So uh, whereabouts are you in this world? Well, I'm in Dyer, Indiana, which is uh, right near Chicago. So we call it Northwest Indiana. Nice, nice. I've been to Chicago one time. Definitely want to go back. Uh, it's a cool city. <laughs> it sure is. Great stuff. Well, I just want to apologize uh, on behalf of my voice. Uh, we are doing this recording today. And uh, a week or so ago, I did catch COVID for the first time, dodged it for two and a half years. So I'm sounding a little bit rough. Um, but uh, apologies for that. But uh, health wise, are, are you okay? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm very healthy and uh, I'm doing really good, especially fantastic, for fantastic. my age, 75. Yeah, you're looking healthy. You're looking oh, healthy. Um, so we are going to uh, dive into the four questions that we start every episode with. Um, and then once we've done those, we'll get into the, to the heart of the show. How's that sound? Sounds pretty good. Brilliant stuff. So I'll give you these questions one at a time. Uh, if you could bullet point answer, uh, and then we'll get going. So first question is, when did you join the military? I joined the military September 1966. Okay. Uh, and what service and branch did you join? Uh, United States Marine Corps, the USMC. Nice. Uh, was there a particular role inside the USMC? Yes, I was a combat, uh, uh, combat infantryman. Nice, nice. Um, and then how long did you serve for? I served four years in the military, uh, but 13 months in Vietnam. Okie dokie. And then the last question is, what rank did you get to? Uh, I became a sergeant. A sergeant. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Okay, Bill, well, what I'm going to do is uh, rewind the clock. Um, where was you born and where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, south side of Chicago. Okay. Um, and how was, uh, was life for you back then? <laughs> Not well, saying you're old. <laughs> it was pretty difficult. Uh, my father was a World War II veteran. Uh, he was uh, with Patton uh, at the Battle of the Bulge. He went through Belgium and uh, he would never talk about it. <clears throat> so um, my mother, she, you know, she wasn't, uh, <clears throat> she had a very difficult time with my dad coming home. So uh, life was pretty rough back then for me. Okay, okay. And and how did you find uh, the likes of schooling and, and education? How was it for you? Well, it was pretty rough. Um, my my father was the one that raised me, and uh, he was a steel worker, and uh, he, he was a very heavy drinker from his PTSD. Uh, they didn't call it PTSD back there. And uh, I always wondered why my father had such a short temper, and uh, he was a good, kind man. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it didn't get the structure I needed to, uh, you know, go to college and, and understand, uh, you know, when you don't have loving parents, it's very difficult for, a, you know, especially a teenager growing up. But I grew up as okay. a, a good kid, just uh, had a difficult time. Right. Um, was you good at anything in particular, um, maybe a oh, subject sure. or, or a sports oh, sure. or anything? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you know, I was uh, uh, fullback on the football team. I was uh, a guard on, uh, no, a forward on the basketball team and lettered and all. Um, I, you know, so. I'm quite, quite, quite active then. Quite active. Very, very active. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, and then as you go through your, your school period, uh do you have the inkling to, to join the military? Uh, I mean, you mentioned about your father. You know, <clears throat> I had to decide what I was going to do after high school. Um, you know, I had no structure about how to apply for college. Uh, my grades were as such that, you know, I had a, I had a, I wasn't going to do good. And it turned out that a lot of my problems were, I uh, have a, a vision problem and I didn't know that until you know, just like the last few years of that I really needed something to to look down. As I would read, and when I was younger, everything would become double. And uh, it was so difficult to read, I would just drop it and forget about it. And so my grades suffered for it. 
and I had a difficult time. So I had to decide what I was going to do with my life. And uh, I decided on, uh, you know, I asked all my friends what was the best service to join. And they said the Marines were the best. So I wanted to be the best and figured I'd make a career out of the Marines. Fair enough. So ha- had you had um, anybody in the family or, or maybe friends of the family that, that joined the Marines before? No, no, I was the first one to join the Marines. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was the first one. Yeah. And did you know that you were going to head off anywhere? Um, so at that time that you were joining, was was uh, was Vietnam kind of starting then? Vietnam was just started. You could start seeing it on the news more and more. And uh, I asked my recruiter, uh, you know, I said, I wanted to have aviation so that I could, you know, work on helicopters. I figured I could go to O'Hare Field and, you know, work on air, jet airplanes or something like that. I figured I'd be a mechanic. And that was my goal. And uh, the drill instructor said, oh, yeah, you, you know, you, you know, we can uh, we can put you in for that and we'll see how you could do. And uh, uh, so it didn't work out that way. When I joined, <laughs> I joined for four years because he said, you know, they won't think you're serious unless you join for four years. So I joined for four years. Right, and of course, right. uh, a basic infantryman is what I ended up. So, okay. So, so going back to you joining, uh, how did you do that back then? Was it a case of, uh, I don't know, writing into somewhere or, or do you have career offices like yeah, we do these days? We had, we had, you know, enlistment places that you could go into. And of course, you know, I was very impressed with uh, the way the Marine looked in their blues. And uh, of course it's, it's very impressive. You think, that's for me, you know. I really, I was, I was really fell in love with the way they looked and the way they acted, and I felt I could really make a career out of it. Okay, so yeah, you like the smartness of of the U.S. Marine Corps, yeah? Yeah, it was really great. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. So you 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 sign up, um, and then you go off to do you call it boot camp or or yeah, uh, we call it boot training? camp. Right. Yep. So uh, there's two places the Marines uh, have their boot camps. One is in Paris Island, Cal- uh, Paris Island, North Carolina. <clears throat> the other is uh, San Diego, California. And uh, we call that Hollywood Marines. So I was a Hollywood <laughs> Marine. Oh, okay. Because of its location <clears throat> or? <laughs> its location. Right. Right. I wasn't sure if you get used for being extras in the movies or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. And how did you find uh, the training yourself? Because you said you were quite, um, you know, an active kid with with all the sports. So how was uh, how was the actual boot camp for you? It's kind of funny because uh, I just came back from my Marine Corps reunion in San Diego. Uh, it's the 80th anniversary of the Third Marine Division. So um, uh, one of the guys said uh, uh, he remembered me from boot camp, and one of the things he remembered was when the drill instructor. You're terrified. You're terrified at the drill instructor. <clears throat> You're standing there at attention. And he said, who's the meanest, baddest son of a gun? He didn't use those <laughs> words, but who's the, who is the meanest and baddest in this group? And I said, me, sir. And <clears throat> I became uh, the uh, one of the squad leaders when I did that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could have been beaten, <laughs> but I wasn't. So you you volunteered yourself. You volunteered yes, yourself. Right, right. Um, so one of my favorite movies is actually Full Metal Jacket, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, right, 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 right. That's U.S. Marine Corps, isn't it? Oh yes, it is. So how 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 similar is boot camp to what you see in that in that movie? Well, it's it's everything in that movie except the you know the guy shooting somebody. I mean, you're 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 yelled and screamed at. You're belittled. You're uh, secretly punched in the solar plexus you're you're punished with i mean they would you know a squat thrust is you squat down you put your hands on the ground you kick your feet out you do a push-up then you sit back up and then you stand that's one squat thrust and the drill instructor would say okay get down and give me squat thrusts forever (laughs) (laughs) not 20 not 30 you know oh wow wow yeah so and so, uh, do you remember how long it was? How long was boot camp? Thirteen months. It was thirteen months. I'm well, sorry, thirteen lot. weeks. Thirteen weeks. 13 okay, weeks. okay, thirteen weeks. Um, and during that time, was there anything that you 
flourished at that you were really good at? I know you said that you put yourself forward to be well, in you charge, know, but I was, I was, uh, I in that summer of 1966, I had put on a lot of weight in those three months <clears throat> and it made me really sluggish. And, uh, I think I could do three pull-ups and by the end of my training, I knocked out, you know, like 50 bang, 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 bang. Really? I mean, they put you into that. You are so worked so hard that you just keep tearing those muscles and keep building them and tearing them and building them. And that's exactly what we did. And, uh, when I came out of there, of course, you, you are pretty well brainwashed and saying, sir, to everybody. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, you just, uh, come out like it's, it's a brainwashing in some ways, but it's, it's a good brainwashing because you have to have discipline and you can't, you, they don't want you to think, they just want you to act with your orders. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> was you, was you good at, say again, sorry. That's the way we were trained. Right. And was you good at anything in particular? So I don't know, shooting or the running or anything like that. You know, I, th I think we were all just, we were made to be one unit and okay. I, I didn't excel at anything. Anybody who uh, couldn't match, you know, match up ended up some way not graduating. Right. Okay. Yeah. I just, I don't want to say what that might happen, <laughs> but you better be able to do your, so there's a test at the end of a boot camp. And if you don't pass that test, you don't become a Marine. And of course, the drill instructor is punished. He could lose his job. So uh, they make sure everybody can pass the test. Okay. Okay. So I'm guessing for you passing the, the test and uh, completing basic training, which is what I call it, but it's boot camp for you guys. Right. Um, <clears throat> was that a very proud moment knowing that you achieved? Oh, yeah. Most can't. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I say most kind, that sounds really bad, but, um, <laughs> but, but you, you're pretty well tortured all the way through it. At, at least back in 1966, you were, you were just <clears throat> overwhelmed with, uh, just commands and learning and, uh, and then you go into, you know, basic infantry training and, uh, you know, uh, uh, infantry training regiment. So you go to two different, uh, schools and you learn more and more as you, you know, develop into the Marines. Okay. Okay. And and lastly, on the boot camp aspects, you mentioned about coming back from uh, a nice reunion. Um, is there a standout moment for yourself from back then uh, that still sticks in your mind today? Um, well, it, it's going back and, and being with my brothers. Uh, it's uh, my, my Vietnam brothers. Uh, it, it's an unbelievable feeling. Uh, to get back with everybody and to talk about, we talk about the war, we talk about funny things, uh, but it, it's, uh, and we had the commanding general of the third Marine division attend our dinner and uh, came to, we have a place, uh, a room we call the bunker. <clears throat> and that's where we have all the booze and everything. And the general came to the bunker and it was, it was really a wonderful trip. Uh, I think good. going to Miramar, uh, that's where Top Gun was, uh, uh, filmed uh, was pretty exciting also and being on the USS Midway uh, was also really exciting so that's cool that's cool I wasn't sure if there's any more uh, you know boot camp uh, stories that came out for yourself but uh, um, it doesn't matter if we don't have any but no. <laughs> so from from the boot camp uh, where where do you go off to do you call it being <clears throat> shipped off or deployed or well what do you call so it? so I'm expecting that I'm going to be going to the air wing, you know, to, you know, work on helicopters and jets and stuff like that. And the list comes out and they, they post it on the wall and all the entire platoon is all scrambling. They're all, you know, everybody is there. And I had to push my way up to see, you know, wh where I was going and everything. <clears throat> and I looked down, it's, you know, it started with, you know, Adam, you know, all the way down i'm looking down finally t oh there's taylor it said uh 0311 which means basic infantrymen and then you look at it, it says westpac ground forces that's western pacific ground forces vietnam 
So I went right out of training, right over to Vietnam. Wow. Okay. It was just, you know, no, no, no aviation whatsoever. That's yeah. A- the only, I got aviation. All right. I ended up helicopter assault. <clears throat> okay. So getting on helicopters and getting off. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so in your head, you're, you're potentially looking at this list to, um, look at where you're going to go and maybe do your mechanical aspect of, you know, within helicopters or, or right, something right, on those right. lines. Um, and you weren't pre-warned or anything that you're just going to go and become, uh, infantry. Right. Right. Wow. <laughs> so, so the, the follow-up came in when, uh, my orders actually had an arrow and it said, um, it said, uh, uh, aviation it said aviation a red so when i came there i came with my clothes and, and my orders and of course when uh we stood on the, the little everybody talks about the little yellow footprints uh we had to from there go into a room and strip totally naked and take everything that we had no matter what it was and put it in, and we gave it to someone they put it all in a box and they were going to mail it home <clears throat> to our families. And of course, I put my orders there and everything. But um, when I they I, I went to and requested office hours so I could uh, uh, talk to the talk to the captain and find out why I didn't get aviation. And he said, "Just show me the orders." So uh. I called home. I called home, and I said, "Do you have them?" And they go, "There were no papers in there whatsoever, Bill. Nothing." No, your orders weren't in there or anything. So what they did is when you get there, they discard all the papers and oh, put nice. in only the necessary things that you brought. Wow. Okay. So I had no proof. Why? Right. So when you said about standing on the yellow uh, footprints, that, that's at the beginning of, of... That's, you get off the bus and they, they tell you, if there's one little piece of that yellow showing, they're going to beat the living hell out of you. Right, 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 right. Okay. So you do so not, that- <laughs> and you don't move either. Okay. So that was 13 weeks ago. You just passed it. And then they're saying, well, prove it. Where, where's your orders? Right. Where's your orders? So you, you had nothing to stand nothing, on. Nothing, um, nothing. Wow. And then, yeah. and then, as you say, you're, you're making your way out to, to Vietnam. Um, and at this stage, how, how far in was the war? Do you, do you recall? Well, you know, it, it, everything was like, uh, just, we heard about the war, about this place in Vietnam. And uh, of course, the drill instructor said, you know, we're the greatest country on earth. There's there's no way we're going to lose this war. You know, so it's probably going to be over by the time you get out of boot camp. Ah, uh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that was the height of the war. When when I got out of boot camp, that was just revving up to getting worse and worse. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And so you... Do you call it getting shipped out? Do you call it getting deployed? What What do you call it in the Marines when you shipped go somewhere out. like that? Yeah, we're yeah. shipping out. Shipping out. Okay. Um, so you <clears throat> are going? Are you going with a bunch of people from boot camp? Is there like a group of you that are heading straight out, or do you go somewhere yeah, first was, and have extra training? It was training? almost everybody I went to boot camp. We're all on an airplane, and uh, we ended up in a place called Okinawa. Uh, it's an island. It's a, a Japanese uh, area territory, and. Uh, we had a base there. I'm not sure if we still do, but we had a base where we did uh, all of our, tr- we did a lot of special training. Okay. And uh, that's, that's what I ended up joining a special landing force. Uh, it was called SLF Alpha. And the reason it was the newest weapon that they had developed to defeat the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And that was, we were stationed on the USS Okinawa helicopter ship LPH-3 and uh, what we did was vertical assaults and we had to learn how to do those vertical assaults so we practiced vertical assaults we practiced jungle training we practiced booby traps I mean just just I mean we went through quite a few weeks of retraining in in jungle warfare and um, so you know we ended up on the ship and uh, going to Vietnam and uh, uh, it was a, a definite experience to, you know, be kind of naive when you're first there and uh, mm. just kind of following the old salts, listening to what they have to say. And of course, they didn't approve of us uh, because 
we just got there and we didn't know what we were doing. And these guys rolled salts. They just stayed with themselves, but we were going to have to prove ourselves. And uh, we, we were going to, I mean, we were, we were definitely going to go. I mean, um, this unit I was in was in constant combat for the whole time I was there. And that's why I wrote the book uh, on full automatic surviving 13 months in Vietnam because it became a survival. Okay. Well, we'll go into that in more detail, hopefully, uh, see what yeah. you can share. Um, so just to clarify a few things, how old were you when you actually got out to Vietnam? I was 18 in the training. And by the time I was on the helicopter ship, I had just turned 19. Okay. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned going out to that island. Um, what, what was it called again? Uh, Okinawa. Okinawa. Um, and then you mentioned about, was it a vertical attack, did you say, or a vertical? Yes, it's a vertical assault. In vertical other words, assault. so we were the surprise. We were the surprise. So one battalion or two battalions would sweep into this area and they would always just go out that third area. So what we were is they would, uh, you know, send us in and become a blocking force. And, and it was a full battalion of Marines that, that I was in. There was four companies, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and uh, 250 men in each, in each company. And, uh, the, uh, you know, we would assault company size, uh, vertical assaults. Usually an entire company would go out and then and the choppers would come back and then they'd go out and they'd uh, bring out another company and put them in another place. And then we'd start sweeping online towards the enemy, or we would be a blocking force and set in positions in a, in a, a good area that we would be able to set up ambushes and stuff like that. So right, right. that's, that's the way we started. So you went to Okinawa, I'm going to say that wrong, Okinawa? Right. Did I say that right? Right. Uh, you went there to do that, like, extra training on top right. of uh, your U.S. Marine Corps training. Right. Yeah. My, when you were there. We were on mic um, boats, and uh, we were on Amtrak's. We made special, you know, it's interesting. We, we ended up on the USS Duluth, and, uh, you know, they, they would lower the back end, and they'd put the door down, and, and then the Amtrak's would just – bam, 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 jump, you know, what, all of them just take right off. And of course, when you're going in an Amtrak and you hit the water and you're going uh, full speed, you go actually underwater <clears throat> and you think right. you're going to, you think you're going to die. And then all of a sudden it pops up like this and it just takes off. <clears throat> so an Amtrak, is right. that, is that a type of it's, boat or? It, it's like a, a tank without a turret. Okay. It's like an and armored, it's, and it's armored got a vehicle. big front door, and all the Marines get inside. They shut the airtight door, uh, watertight door, and uh, you just take off. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, go on. We can say something. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> uh, but we also did mic boat landings too, just like in World War II. You know, they circle the boats, and then all of a sudden they'd all go, you know, online and attack. So we okay. did those too. So we did a lot of training. It was yeah, lots yeah. and lots of training. How long was you there before you went to actual Vietnam? You know, doing that extra training. Yeah, that was about six weeks. Six weeks. Okay. About six um, weeks. Was there anything that stood out for you being there that you can remember or that you thought, you know what? I'm ready. I was in learning mode. Learning. And, you know, you know, talking to the other Marines and, you know, learning the listening to commands and it was, it was just a real learning experience is what it was. You just had to learn. And, and on weekends we would get, uh, R and R, R and R, uh, we would get, um, you know, weekend Liberty into the local town and usually a place called Kinville. And okay. of course, you know, you could drink. It didn't make any difference. They didn't have any age right. requ requirements. So you had some time to kind of like chill out and, uh, Right. Yeah. Recharge, I suppose, ready right. for the next, the, the following week's training. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you went from there to Vietnam. Um, was you sent there in helicopters? How, how did you get transported over? Well, our, our rear was the USS Okinawa. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So we went 
down deep into the ship and they wanted to keep the Marines away from everybody. So we were down in the deep of the ship and uh, they would bring us on deck and exercise us periodically. But um, the most part, we were, we were on ship only three or four days. We were always in Vietnam doing, uh, we were, the one thing about us was so different than other battalions. When, when you had another battalion, they were in like uh, Phu Bai or Chu Lai or Da Nang or wherever you had these battalions of Marines and they just did the area. They knew their area, but yeah. we were, we were all over. We were in the DMZ and then we were in the Quezon Valley and then, you know, the street without joy, all these different uh, battle sites. And that's, what's really different about uh, the special landing force alpha. And uh, the, the one bad thing was, is that we kept on getting wiped out. I mean, all of our leaders kept on getting killed. So every squad leader, every platoon commander, every lieutenant, every uh, platoon sergeant, every squad leader I ever had was wounded and killed and I'd get a new one. And they were wounded and killed and got a new one. And they were wounded and killed. So, I mean, it was just a constant replacement of, of new people. And, oh, right. Uh, yeah, constant, constant. So I, I'm going to apologize. I'm probably going to ask us some stupid questions. Um, there are, there's no stupid questions. That's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> um, so just to clarify, so I can get it correct in my head, uh, you were based essentially on on a ship. Is right. that correct? Right. And then you right. would you would then go to mainland uh, Vietnam from the right. ship, do a right. task, and then you would come back, replenish, and then get ready for the next one. Is that correct? That's hitting it right on, right on the head. Okay. And, and each time we went out, it was, there was a name, an operation. Okay. Every time we would go, we'd go. So we'd be on an operation, we'd complete the operation. And then they would bring the helicopters from the ship back out in the field in Vietnam. We'd get on the helicopters. We might just go on another operation somewhere else. We didn't necessarily go back to the ship. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Right. And we got resupplied every three days, you know, so you had to really watch your food and ammo at all times. All right. So uh, roughly how long were you away from the ship each time or, or did that vary? Uh, between a month and a month and a half before we went back on the ship. Oh, wow. Okay. So then I'm guessing you have to uh, not only look after your ammo and your food, but look after yourself. And I'm guessing there's not much time to uh, be looking after yourself, right? Cleaning There's yourself, not much time at all. There's, no. you know, uh, so you, you set in every single night and you had to dig a hole every single night that, you know, that protected you. So, um, and we were, we were in the jungle or we would be in the rice paddies or we would be uh, in the DMZ or we'd be in the hills. I mean, you never knew where we were going to be, but we we were literally all over the i area, which is where almost all of the major battles were back then. Okay. Uh, the North Vietnamese were just just sending in more and more and more troops. No matter how many we killed, it just would, the more we increased our troops, the more they increased theirs. Right, right. Now, uh, just for people that might not know too much about Vietnam or maybe even battles uh, in general, uh, you have mentioned a couple of times the DMZ. Uh, so what area? I, I think that was north, north area, wasn't it? Right. It's it's a DMZ means demilitarized zone. So it's the area that divides the north and the south Vietnam, and no one's supposed to be in there. It's a demilitarized. So in other words, you know, it's just the line between the north and the south. Uh, and the North constantly violated it. So the South, uh, so we as Marines had to go in into the DMZ area and uh, try to liquidate the, the numbers that were coming in. And they would send an entire regiment. Uh, that's uh, thousands into mm. an area. And uh, we had the firepower. They had the will. We had the firepower. And And one of the biggest problems with Vietnam is you know, you served most most military serves twelve months in Vietnam. Marines serve thirteen. And once you've learned exactly you know exactly what you're doing, then they send you home. And this new guy that has to replace you has to learn those lessons all over again. You can't find a war that way. You gotta you gotta say we're in it or we're not. Otherwise, 
you know, all those lessons that I learned to stay alive and how I became so good of a soldier at the end was because I learned how to stay alive. And uh, of course, when you come home, you've got those same PTSD, it comes out into PTSD. You know, your survival starts kicking in and that's mm. where there's big problems when okay. we come home. So you mentioned that you were out there for 13 months. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you want to break this down, uh, but maybe yeah. the first three to four months, you learning your place in the country. Um, by this time, you've probably done a few operations. What stands out for you in the in the first few months? You know, I remember the first time I was uh, shot at. So uh, it was on uh, Operation Beaver Cage slash Operation Union. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of the veterans will remember the, the, this battle because we won the presidential unit citation for this battle. And uh, so the North Vietnamese were coming into the Khoi San Valley in uh, thousands. And that's where they got their food. Uh, so this valley was very rich in rice. And uh, the farmers, whether they were, you know, whether they wanted to help or didn't want to help, they had to give food to the, to the, uh, the, the North Vietnamese. Um, and so what our job was, we're going to cut off the food supply. So we knew they came in from the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the mountains. So that's, we sent in battalions coming this way, battalions coming this way. And then, of course, we're coming from the ocean and we're sweeping up. And uh, that was huge battles what took place. And uh, we lost our executive officer in, in that one and uh, the company executive officer. And, and I explain in detail about this. But I remember the first time I was shot at. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's nothing like you train for. So you train and they're shooting and it's going on. They're shooting over your head. And, and you're, you know, you're learning how to act when you're shot at. But the actual time I was shot at, the, the adrenaline surge is through the roof. You know someone's trying to kill you. You're trying to find a place to hide. And then you're returning fire. And uh, that's why I call the book on full automatic, because whenever we were fired at, we would fire on full automatic because that's we had to gain the fire superiority. And uh, so you'd throw 20 rounds out there just just like that, just in seconds, 20 rounds are flying out of your M16s. And uh, so I, I remember that uh, they sent in mortars on top of those guys wherever the wherever those shots were coming from over a hill and of course then they stopped and then we started moving on again and then i remember the first time we were mortared it was the same day or the next day we're walking along and all of a sudden i hear bloop 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 and and the old timers are screaming at us get down get down and of course we're all looking at each other get down for what <laughs> we didn't you know and then all of a sudden <laughs> over our heads uh, the rounds were going over our heads and I'm going, Oh my God, they're mortaring us. And then the explosions. So then you got down and I remember I, I never forgot that sound again. So that was the learning experience, getting shot at, getting cover, getting mortared, hearing the bloops, get down first. Cause you hear it, you hear it before anything happens. And so that was constant from then on all the way through my tour. You could always get down. You always knew exactly what was going on. You always knew how to how to react after that first time. But uh, I remember the one thing I remember about that operation the most was was uh, it was going to be imminent. We were going to get overrun that night, and you know I'm just terrified. There's no no moon whatsoever, none, and that's when they love to do their attacking was at night, and it's like oh my gosh, you know we're going to die. We're going to die. And then all of a sudden I heard some firing in front of us. You know, it was like ambushes uh, going off, you know, that they had sent out ambushes and they were ambushing. They were starting to come. And then all of a sudden I heard this airplane flying overhead and uh, it sounded, I'm, I'm looking up, I, I hear an airplane, but what the heck's an airplane doing here? Then all of a sudden out of the clear blue sky, this ray of light comes down, a ray 
of light. And it was swooping like this. And what it was is spooky. I don't know if you ever heard of that name before, but they called him Puff the Magic Dragon was another name. It, it was an old DC-3 that they converted over to a gunship. And they had miniguns, uh, up to two or three miniguns. And they they could cover every, that though that unit could cover every square inch of a football field in a minute, every wow. square inch. So when they fired and they, and they had uh, the ability to be able to, to see uh, heat, you know, the, you know, they had the, the, the technology that they could tell where, where the people were and they were just annihilating the, the North Vietnamese in in the Valley. And uh, it, it was such a thrill and, and it, and it would drop these huge uh, canisters of, of light. And they would just slowly come down and would light up the whole area. And it was like, oh, my gosh, you know, and then all of a sudden it would go out. And there we uh, are again. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was one of those sleepless nights. But uh, Spooky had saved the day. He came back again and uh, did another. And there was pretty much, uh, you know, we got small ambushes from then on and stuff like that. But uh, they really they really were affected. But they they were very good at using mortars. And uh, uh, they were, so the Viet Cong were stealthy, very stealthy. So the, all, they, all they had was, you know, a few magazines, maybe a bandolier wrapped around their, their black pajamas and, an, uh, and you know, an AK-47. And you could see them running every once in a while and you'd try to take aim at them. And they, they were stealthy. We had 50, 60 pound packs. And, you know, we're like that big elephant that, you know, is out. But, you know, the tiger's trying to get him, but he just can't seem to get him. I mean, we had the fire superiority with our, uh, you know, with our, uh, you know, our artillery. We had the jets that came in and just bombed them and napalmed them. And uh, in the daytime, that's where we really were outstanding uh, most of the time. But they always set up ambushes for us. They always that's what they would do. I mean, that's how they would attack us. They wouldn't just come out and say, you know, charge or not most of the time. They, they mostly just like a hit and run, hit yeah. and run. And uh, so we didn't experience waves until later on in, in the DMZ where it got pretty bad. So, right. <clears throat> so, um, what time of year was you out there when you started your 30 month tour? That was April. Uh, the first uh, operation was April of 1967. Okay. Okay. And, now, and what's, what's the weather like for us that's never been to Vietnam? Well, you know, we trained in Okinawa and, and the weather was like 70s, 80s. So, you know, that's what we assumed Vietnam was going to be. But on that first operation, I mean, it was 110 humid as all get out and uh i remember uh that first day it was like we landed early in the morning and then we had a hump they they landed us five miles from where we were supposed to land and then we had to go five miles in this heat just to get to where we were supposed to be in the first place and then to be pushing on towards the mountains and valleys and and the heat is just the heat stroke we lost um probably close to a third of our men in the first and second day uh just by heat okay okay just by the heat it was so bad and of course a lot of lessons our leaders learned from that also um, right i know i if i after that operation you know, i always carried uh, two canteens because you you never know you needed water all the time especially in that horrible horrible heat <clears throat> so the stealthy was a nice way to go, but we, you know, we couldn't do stealthy. We had a, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, talking of stealthy, uh, whilst you were talking then I just had to look up what a hundred degrees in Fahrenheit. Now, most people might know this, but I don't, and there could be others like me. So it's 37.7 degrees Celsius, which is very hot. And I'm guessing it was quite humid as well is it is yes, that right the yeah. yeah absolutely the humidity was ungodly yeah. so it, it just added more it was just hotter and hotter i mean it was we ended up uh it was so hot that we have flak jackets that we always wore 
uh, kind of like a bulletproof vest. Okay. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, we had to, you know, load them in helicopters and send them back because it was just, just that extra weight was killing us. It was too much. Yeah. yeah right. And making us hot at the same yeah. token. Yeah. Um, so my next question is, um, now soldiers, Marines, uh, British, American, we are, we are well-trained. And, and when we go to operations, when we go to, uh, war, we are well-trained, but were there times in your first few months when you thought, holy shit, <laughs> um, I'm not going to survive this. That, so when I first started, it was very naive. I was very naive. And um, I, I just thought it was, you know, I'll be working my way through it. And then uh, when we ended up on Operation Buffalo, um, we lost, um, we lost our, um, I lost my platoon sergeant and my squad leader. And um, it was a battle in the DMZ. And uh, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines had gotten, uh, one of the companies had been almost totally destroyed by the North Vietnamese, and we had to go get the bodies. We never leave our bodies behind. And um, what, what was the question again? Uh, did you the... feel uh, in danger? Oh, yeah. All right. So I think from Operation Buffalo, that was the first time that I really thought I was going to die. I I didn't think there was a chance of me surviving. I mean, everybody started uh getting killed after, after Buffalo. Um, we, end, we, the, the next month, that was July of 67. The next battle was, um, uh, August, uh, 68. And, uh, there was only seven guys left in my platoon and, and we had to go out for the bodies in, in the middle of the night of the guys that died out there in the battlefield. And then, uh, and, and I said, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. And then October I got overrun by uh, the North Vietnamese. Uh, we were setting up a trap on Operation Medina and we were the blocking force. And uh, uh, another battalion of Marines was going through the Highland Forest and uh, we had to, uh, we got overrun. And uh, they came in and killed, uh, killed our executive officer in our company and wounded the captain and all of the lieutenants on, and all, all the platoons but one, my platoon. And uh, he managed to survive. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's a horrible experience. And, and then, you know, when you go through that, you think there's no way you're going to survive. You just, then you end up in the, back in the DMZ and you're standing lines uh, during the monsoon season and you're just cold and wet and freezing. And then, then, then you go further uh, that you finally leave there and you, you walk to the ocean and uh, we get in the mic boats and they take us up just south of the DMZ along the, uh, uh, right on the ocean. And that we developed a place called C4, my company. And then we had a guard C4 from the D all the way to the DMZ. So we ran patrols every day to the DMZ. And, uh, and it was, we got contact almost every single day. It was like, uh, and, and to, th I remember thinking to myself, um, I didn't even know the names of the new guys in my platoon. I just, I decided that at some point in time, I wasn't going to remember these people. And uh, so like today, if I were to think back at the names of the, the guys that were the survivors, the, the guys who had came into my platoon, I, I couldn't barely tell you one, but the guys, when I first got there, you know, I know all their names. I, I can almost tell you where they're from. So yeah, you, 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 whole life starts changing and uh you know it's just uh two weeks before my rotation date my third purple heart came through whereas i was wounded three times over there and uh i was glad to finally i knew i was getting out and uh oh i can't even tell you how i did, i never thought i was going to make it there's a couple of times there's one one time where i actually found uh you know, I always wondered about God, if there was a God, you know, uh, I always knew there was a God, but I always had that little bit of like this 5% of, I wish I had proof, wish, I wish I had proof. I mean, something physical. And then what I was, I thought I was going to die in this one bombardment. I thought I was going to die. And I was screaming out and I screaming out for God. And, uh, 
you know, I, I, I mean, I don't, it's just so surreal to this day. I think about screaming. And then a, when I asked him to, you know, I said my act of contrition, I was, I thought I was going to die. I saw the mortar to the mortar coming out of the tube because you could hear the bloops. I saw the one that was going to land on me and blow me to a million pieces. I saw it come out. And when, when I was screaming for God, all of a sudden it stopped. And at that moment, I thought to myself, at the moment of my death, eminent death, I turned to, to God. And then that made me realize, oh my gosh, there's my evidence, 100%. I'll never, I'll never doubt again. And I don't to this day, you know? Okay. You know, you got to be in that experience in order to understand it. And I'm yeah. sure some of your listeners will know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, so when you asked me, I, did I change? Did I, anything happen? That's what happened. I became really good at survival. Okay. Really good. Okay. And, and it shows in my book. Now you mentioned about getting the purple heart. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about having it three times. Now, I don't know if that's an, only an American thing. That's the only country I'm aware of to use the Purple Heart. Uh, but that's, as far as I'm aware, you receive one when you get wounded in action, in combat. Right. Um, now, if this is too difficult, you don't have to answer. But can you explain those times that you were injured and therefore received those Purple Hearts? Sure. Um, so, I the first time I was wounded was on Operation uh, Cochise. Uh, I was trapped in a rice paddy. Uh, there was a tree line in front of us, and they were just spraying, killing my whole platoon in August. And um, anybody who came out to help us was eliminated. We were too close to the tree line to bring in artillery or to bring in helicopters. And... Um, but uh, after being stuck out there from like eight or nine in the morning to three in the afternoon, uh, there was a lull in the in the firing, and I just made a beeline run for cover uh, into another rice paddy further away, and I made it. And then, then as I started to crawl, they were shooting at me because I wanted to crawl from then on, stay keep a low profile, and uh, they were dropping in uh, like uh, these portable grenades that uh, that come out and one of them exploded and put shrapnel on my left arm and uh, but I managed to come back I didn't even know I was wounded until I came back uh, behind the lines and I was sitting there and I guess there was blood running down my arm and the corpsman came over and and uh, you know he took care of it the the shrapnel he got it out and wrapped up my arm and I stayed out in the field uh, that was the first time and then uh when I was uh, overrun in October, um, uh, I managed to to not be wounded in that uh, engagement. But a few days later, I was on a patrol and uh, they were throwing grenades and I got uh, shrapnel in my back. And uh, so I was medevaced out of the field and they took the, the shrapnel out of my back. And uh, then my third one was in, in the battle for C4 was the name of the, by the DMZ. And it was on January 19th, 1968. And uh, uh, it was a horrendous battle. And uh, they were shooting at us and throwing grenades. And one of the grenades exploded and, and got me in the arm again. And, uh, you know, I didn't even, the adrenaline flows, when the adrenaline flows, you don't even know you're wounded. Uh, when I was had shrapnel in the back, I didn't know I was even wounded. I just thought I was sweating down my back. I thought it was just sweat was right. just running down. And I, and I wanted to wipe the sweat away from my back when I got back. And I looked at my hand. It was all full of blood. And I go, oh, my God, I got shrapnel. And so that I showed somebody. And uh, I didn't actually feel the shrapnel until I got on the helicopter. And, of course, I'm sitting in the seat and I was leaning back and I went, oh, my gosh, that hurts. Uh, okay. So, you know, and then all of a sudden it was starting to throb. And when I got back to the ship, uh, they took me right into uh, sick bay where, you know, they took out the shrapnel. And uh, I still have that piece of shrapnel you do. that was in my back. Yeah. Wow. yeah, I still have it. My daughter has it. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, those, uh, those were the three times. And yeah. uh, 
but you know, it's like God was watching out for me, and I think I was meant to write this book because um, I don't, I don't, I don't know how I survived. Because you know, if if I'm standing, if I'm here, and the bullets are coming here, if I was over here, I would have gotten the bullet, and the bullets were that close, and I was just moving so fast. I, I think. You know, if the first shot didn't get me, then I, w- I was already in cover. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just, I just feel that I was very, very lucky uh, yeah. to survive that whole ordeal. Yeah. And to and only have minor wounds while everybody else is dead and wounded around me. You know, it's ridiculous. You know, you, yeah. you feel like you're blessed, but, you know, you still have to make it through the bad day and then still make it, you know, it's, it's so that's what I talk about in my book is the fact that you can't wait until you can get out. You can't wait until you leave. You know, when you first get there, you you're fighting for America, John Wayne, you know, uh, you know, Iwo Jima, you watch, you watch all the movies, you, you think it's glorious. And then you get into these battles and you don't think you're going to live. I mean, and your attitude starts going, Oh my gosh. I th- I remember it was right in the middle of my tour that I, that I thought, you know, this is crazy. You know, I'm looking around and these people live in villages. It's like the stone age and, and it's huts. They live in huts, dirt floors, you know, with bamboo, uh, you know, like rugs, uh, small little things they lay down to keep the dust down. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, these people they don't know who we are they they're 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 trying to kill us they're, they don't understand what we're there for we're trying to help them at least in my mind that's what i was and then i started thinking so who are we fighting and i said yeah we're fighting the north vietnamese they're from the north and we're fighting the Viet Cong. well who are the Viet Cong? the people from the south who are we fighting we're there to help the people of the south why are they fighting us? And there was so many. There was so many Viet Cong. I mean, if you go out into the into the rice paddies areas that we were in. They all hated us. If they didn't hate us, they would want nothing to do with us. They they uh, we tried to help them. We did things to try to help them. Uh, and then when you get a bunch of Marines that are so tough. Some of them were actually somewhat disrespectful because they're so tough. Uh, you get some people back in, in at that time. We it's not like today where you got to be almost you got to have college to become a marine. Back then, uh, if you were, had petty theft and you went up in front of the judge and the judge would say, "What do you want? Uh, two years in the military, or do you want two years in prison?" That's the kind of people we were getting, people who were, you know, needed correction, need, needed structure, but, you know, they were put into that situation. They didn't want to be there. Yeah. They didn't mm. join the Marines. They were told they better join. And, yeah. of course, you know, and when I first went over there, was, we were almost all we had joined. By the time I left, there was a lot of draft coming in, and right. they, didn't want to, they didn't want to be there either. So, okay. So you mentioned... Um kind of your mindset uh, in some ways changing, going out there, you know, fighting for America and and, and all the people out there. Um, you get wounded, you get wounded three times. And is there a point to the end of your 30 months out there, um, could be in that 13th month, that you, 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 are, you are praying, you are wishing to get home? Yeah, that's all you're doing. You know, there's two things, the wish to go home, to serve your time and stay alive. And uh, the other thing was um, to, that you that you really wanted to s- stay alive. And I had two things. And for some reason, I forgot the other. So uh, what was the question again? Maybe it'll pop back in my head. <laughs> uh, the question was, Kind of like the counting down the days, wishing to get home. Oh yeah, yeah. It, all you wanted to do was uh, protect and serve the guys around you. They are your brothers, and to then come home, just come home alive. 
And yeah. uh, that's what it becomes. It becomes a matter of survival. Uh, you wanted to survive just to make sure you got home. And um, when you left, you kind of had a feeling of uh, guilt because you're leaving all these new guys. Right. And and you you know what you've been through. And then you see these guys and you say goodbye to them. And then you come home with guilt. You know, like I left my brothers there. 